Dear Holy Father, we uh, thank you for this day. I thank you for these students. Just pray to be with us this week. Help us to, uh, again, just understand a little bit more about complex analysis. Pray to be with the students as they uh, work on this course and other courses this semester. I just pray you build them up and just use them as servants for your kingdom, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. All right, so uh, last time I told you the theorem of Carre Theodori, which roughly speaking said this, um, f prime of a, uh, which is the limit as z goes to a of f of z minus f of a over z minus a um, exists uh, if and only if uh, there exists this function phi um, uh, from the domain of the function um, to the complexes such that, uh, let's see here, one thing is we had phi of, um, basically phi of z is equal to um, let's see here, how's it go? Well, that's not the right way to write it. f of z um, is equal to f of a uh, plus v of z times z minus a and to I forget if the one and two are up. oh other way that that was actually that's I just rewrote criteria two that was two as I might I numbered it last time and then one was that phi um, continuous. So phi of z goes to um, f prime of a um, as z goes to a. So what's on the right-hand side here, you refer to as the uh, Carathéodory's criteria for differentiability of a complex function. And um, it's a useful useful theorem because it allows us proofs of things that are really kind of nice and tidy. Let me show you one. So actually we're just going to, I'm not even going to do a proof exactly, I'm going to just give you a discussion and from this discussion we're going to discover a proof of something. All right. So let's assume that uh, say f and g are um, differentiable. Let me say complex differentiable complex differentiable at uh, z equals to a, all right? So that is to say that this, you know, difference quotient exists, right? Now, the, I mean, the limit of the difference quotient exists, to be more specific. So we can apply the theorem of Carthiodori, right, twice. So there exists, let's say, phi sub f and phi sub g such that what? Well, f of z is equal to f of a plus, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually write the z minus a first, if you don't mind, z minus a times phi f of z, right? And what else? Likewise for g, right? g of z is g of a plus z minus a times phi sub g of z. These are kind of like tangent line of ah! <laughs> Scary. That was terrifying. <laughs> Nobody told me he was here. <laughs> 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 Probably couldn't see it on the video. My son has come to class today and he has leapt out and attacked me. And, you know. Isaac? No, this is, uh, this is Daniel. Okay. Were you planning this with Hannah yesterday? I can tell from the dimple, yes. <laughs> yeah. Just as I, ex I should have expected this. All right. Now, um, so we have these approximations for f of z and g of z in terms of these... Um, 
these different quotient, quotient functions, the phi sub f and the phi sub g. So one of the things I can do, of course, is I can look at, say, the product of f of z and g of z, right? What do I do? So look at that. What do you get? f of z times g of z is equal to what? Multiply this expression by that expression, right? So of course you get f of a, g of a, right? You get terms that are linear in z minus a. In particular, you get phi of z times what? Think about it. You get phi f of z times g of a plus f of a times phi g of z. So those are the, the terms with linear z minus a, right? And then what else is left? There are four terms in total, right? I've got three of them up there. The other term is what? z minus a squared times phi f of z phi g of z. Ah! <laughs> That's still scary to me for some reason. <laughs> Hmm. See, if we can get him into the Calc 3 room early enough. <laughs> hmm. If we had like covered desks so you could hide under, that would be more effective. But. OK. Um, so the point here is once you have this, once you do this calculation, it becomes obvious what the derivative of the product should be. The derivative of the product should naturally be this piece right here. So basically, that's our candidate for phi fg of z. So to prove that that, in fact, is the uh, phi function for the product fg, what do we have to do? Oh, I'm wrong. Let's see here. To make it the phi function, what equation do I have to? That's not quite. It's not quite right. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm being too greedy. I mean, what, what do we have to have for the phi function for f of g? We have to have f g, right? The product of f and g times z is equal to the product of f and g um, times a plus z minus a times what? Phi f g of z, whatever that is. Right. So if I need this, ah. Um, if we want property 2 for f times g, right, we, we want this, right? So what, what do I have to define the, the phi fg to be? I can't, I can't just make it what I have currently. I need to do this, right? I need to say, move this over to here. Then I have identity 2. I had to throw in that other piece. All right? So with that definition, it is clear that this, defi this, this satisfies, this clearly um, satisfies item two of Cara Theodore's criteria, right? Essentially, I mean, I just rearrange the equation to make it so. And then what is the other thing I need? I need that it's continuous. So is, is, is this continuous? Well, let's, let's look at it. What's the limit as z goes to a of phi fg of z as is so defined? So you, you look at it up here, right? It's, it's phi f. Phi f, I can plug in the limit point, right? Because phi f is continuous, so I can just you know, plug in the limit point because it's continuous. And again, I have a, a sum, <laughs> I mean, a product of continuous functions, z minus a, phi f of z. So again, that's what? That's a minus a, which of course is 0.
right? And because that's continuous and because it satisfies criteria two, we proved last time, that implies that the difference quotient exists for the product. And more than that, the value of the derivative of a product of two functions is just equal to whatever this limit works out to. What does it work out to? You got f prime of a, g of a, plus f of a, g prime of a, and that's zero. So there you go. f g prime of a is equal to that. Now you're like, that's not the proof I remember from calculus one. <laughs> that may be the case. How did you prove this in calculus one? Got too close. <laughs> I need a lecture from over here today. <laughs> yeah, don't turn my back. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, thankfully, Jenny does not make a habit of hiding places and jumping out and hitting me. <laughs> that would that would make married life more interesting <laughs> in a bad way. <sighs> I, I've heard of couples like that, like where the, the man like just enjoys like scaring his wife and like it's something he does. And, yeah, of course that's only really complete if you post it on YouTube before the divorce. <laughs> but um, so no, in calculus one, what you did was you looked, yeah, you looked at specifically looked like the limit of a difference quotient, and you added zero in a systematic way in order to make the derivative of f appear and the derivative of g appear. You had to use the continuity of one of the functions in order to pull out the, um, the term. Um, so you know the, the proof in calculus one without the theorem of Carr Theodore involves addition of zero and some kind of subtle points. I would like to point out to you the, the, the really cool thing about this theorem, once you get used to the, you know, there's a slight cost of abstractness to start with, but once you see what it's doing, it's removing all kinds of like adding zeros and a lot of sort of ad hoc limit calculations, it just makes it into something you can just do, right? We just discovered the proof of the theorem without, with just, just a calculation, isn't that, I think that's really cool. And you can do this in Calculus 1, too. Ah! What? Ah! Go back to your hole! Ah! Go back! Hey! No hitting! He brought a computer. Does he have Minecraft? No, I think mostly um, whatever apps you can fit on a, on a on a little Chromebook that has whatever my wife has installed. Very not not much. Okay, so. Angry Birds. I, do you have Angry Birds, Dan? <laughs> no. Ah, yeah, I'm talking. Very good. Um, so I in in the notes I have a I have a very similar analogous calculation for the quotient. What I do is I I do some algebra and I work out what's the what's the phi function for f over g. All right. I'm not going to do that in here. You can read it. Um, we're going we're gonna to go on. So, Now, in your homework, I, af I ask you to use this technology to show complex differentiable. And I also ask you to just do this directly. All right. I want you to understand both. But today, we're going to look at yet another way, um, which is to look at the real and imaginary um, components of a function. And we'll study something called the, the uh, did I make? You showing the chain rule uh, with Carthiodori's theorem part of the homework. I see it coming. It doesn't count. You have to wait. You have to wait until I'm not looking. <laughs> this could get annoying. Did I? I forget. Did I make the the homework show show that the, the you have the chain rule from Carthiodori's theorem as a homework? No. Had it. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Ow! Daniel, stop. Ow. So here's a th <coughs> theorem. Oh, just his computer. All right, theorem. <laughs> the derivative with respect to z of f of g of z, right, is equal to f prime of g of z times dg dz. This is, of course, the ordinary chain rule, right? 
let me sketch for you the proof using the theorem of Carr Theodory. So of course, I have to assume that f and also g are differentiable at appropriate points. Um, so let's suppose uh, g prime of a and f of g, f prime of g of a um, exist um, also. Let's suppose that g of z is equal to g of a plus z minus a times phi g of z by the theorem of Carr Theodory. And we'll also suppose that f of, let's see, I need some other letter. Let's say w is equal to um, f of g of a, all right, plus w minus g of a times, let's say, psi, um, psi f of w. So I'm using differentiability of g at a. I'm using differentiability of f at g of a. Okay. So to, you know, to calculate the derivative of the composite, simply compose. Simply compose. If, so if we do that, we've got what f of f of g of z is equal to what? Whoa, Daniel, careful! You're gonna hurt yourself, man. Ow! Cut it out. I will call mom and have you go home. It was funny to start with, but it's time to stop. Okay. All right. Thank you. So <laughs> using this, basically we're just thinking of w equals to g of z, right? So since w, you could just you know set w equals to g of z, what do we get? We get f of g of a, right? plus, and I'm just going to leave it as w for a second here, w minus g of a, phi f of w. But that's equal to what? f of g of a plus what? So w was what? w was g of z minus g of a. And then here, what do we have? Psi f of what? g of z, right? So all I've done is used, um, oh, oh, I can do one more step though. What should I do? I can, I replace g of z with what? Let me be a little bit greedier here. I don't want to write too much. So I can replace g of z with what? Remember g of z has this expression, so I can replace g of z with g of a plus z minus a, uh, ba -da -ba -da, phi g of z. See? Oh, but that was stupid. Did I really want to do that? I didn't want to do that. I'm sorry, guys. Let me try this again. It wasn't wrong. It just wasn't useful. So replace the w with g of z plus g of a um, plus z minus a. So I, I should have expanded the, the, the g of z here with this, right? So there. Oop. So that's this w. And then minus g of a. So are you, are you zoomed in on this, Lilia? OK, good. Um, and then let's see here. Ah, stupid board. <laughs> Psi f of what was w? w was g of z, right? All right. So this is multiplied here. So if you look at this, <coughs> you see what happens is what, what do you have? Let's 
See, I want to factor out a, um, a z minus a. I should be getting a, a, a z minus a. The other, I, I, there's too much here. What's the deal with the g of z? That shouldn't be there. Oh, oh, I'm, 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 I'm making this. I'm sorry. Let me try yet again. You're about to tell me to do what I'm doing. I think. So look, I should have looked at it this way. I've got w minus g of a, right? So if you go back up to the purple line, g of z minus g of a is just what? It's, I'm not sure what I did in that last attempt, but um, here's what it should have been. So I'm just, I'm just looking at what's in purple and re you know, subtracting g of a to the other side <coughs> and realizing that that's w minus g of a. OK, there we go. Now we have it. Now we have it. So this <coughs> term is what I would say is the, uh, the phi of the composite, right? This is phi of the composite. You can see that it satisfies um, identity 2 for the theorem of Carr Theodori, right? Because if you take f of g of z minus f of g of a, you get z minus a times this stuff. Because we've just worked it out. I mean, we did the algebra to make 2 happen. And then, OK, that said, if this phi of f composed with g as so defined is continuous at the limit point, then we have it, right? Is it? What's the limit? What's the limit as uh, z goes to a of? Um, phi of f composed with g of z, what's that equal to? We can do the, it's the limit as z goes to a of phi g of z. We know what that is, right? And then times psi f of the limit as z goes to a of g of z. Now, how can I pull the limit inside the psi? There's a, there's a, com there's a com composite limit law, right? If you have a function that's continuous, you can pull the limit inside the function when it's continuous at that point. That, that limit law is still true in the complex case. Granted, I, I haven't proved it, but um, I could show you if you wanted to see in office hours. It's the same as the Calc 1 proof. So anyway, what we have here then is, of course, g prime of a, because g is assumed to be differentiable. And then this is what? f prime of what? This thing is g of a, right? And there you have it. There's the chain rule, as proved by the theorem of Carr Theodori. Because we've shown one and we've shown two, and the, we've showed that the limit of the, the quotient function is, in fact, what it's supposed to be for the, for the chain rule. I think I made this a homework last year, but uh, I hope I didn't make it a homework this year. Otherwise, you guys just tricked me. All right. Um, of course, you could also prove, like, uh, you know, other things you could easily prove. Easier to prove than what I've done today. F plus, did I do this last time? F plus g prime of z is equal to f prime of z plus g prime of z and c times f prime of z is equal to c f prime of z. In other words, linearity of the complex derivative. OK, that was another class. Sorry, all I'm teaching this semester is calculus. It's hard for me to remember which calculus I've done in which calculus class. I've got my business calculus. I've got calculus 3. I've got, I've got yeah, 126. And then I've got this class, which is called complex analysis. But when you get right down to it, it's calculus. Um, and then, of course, there's advanced calculus. And 
all of these things are at some point or another going to cover a product rule. And I'm not, you know, it starts to kind of flow together in my mind sometimes. So, um, okay. I can't decide if I feel worse for your business calculus students, the poor little business majors. Oh, they're, they're adorable. Don't worry about them. They're fine. <laughs> they're fine. Then I feel bad for you for having to teach them. They're, they're, they're fine. They're fine. This is their last math class. I want to leave them loving math. So. What's that? Well, they're taking it, so no. It's mostly as if they leave the course. It's that's the love must be, you know. But <coughs> All right. So that said, I now want to talk to you about yet another way, a third way, third method for analyzing f prime um, of z. All right, and this is what's known as the Cauchy-Riemann Cauchy equations. Now, to properly discuss this, I have to spend probably about a half hour developing the theory of real differentiability of functions from R2 to R2. Okay, I don't want to hurry that. I'll start it today, but before I before I before I put this on its proper footing, I'm going to show you the theorem, and I'm going to show you how it's used. All right, and then the next class I'll go through the proof, the proper proof of what we're doing. So, just to let you know the, the lay of the land here, I'm going to take out a logical loan, as it were. All right, so here's the theorem. If we have f is equal to u plus iv, right? Um, you know, it's a complex, it's a complex valued function of a complex variable. So here z is equal to x plus iy, and um, so f of z is equal to u of z plus i times v of z. Some notation we can use here. u and v, uh, you know, in terms of notation, the real part of f is equal to u. The imaginary part of f is equal to v. So u and v are separately the real valued functions of z, right? Now, since we identify z with the, with the plane, with R2, you could also say that u and v are just functions of R2. They're real valued functions from R2 to R. Okay? So that means that you can talk about partial derivatives of u and v with respect to x or y. Okay? So here's the theorem. If f is a complex value function of a complex variable, and here's the technical fine print, and u and v are continuously differentiable at z naught. Well, let's just say in an open, not at z naught, but continuously differentiable on an open set, <coughs> excuse me, um, <coughs> centered about z naught, right? Let me say that's criteria one. And two, all right, now I, I, I am assuming that they are, con they are continuously, continuously differentiable on an open set centered about z naught, all right? Now, and, and two, and two, if ux, of z naught is equal to v y of z naught, and if u y of z naught is equal to minus v x of z naught. So these are real partial derivatives, right? At that one point, okay, that one point. <coughs> Uh, 
then here's the punchline. F prime of Z naught exists, and moreover, it's just equal to UX of Z naught plus I times VX of Z naught. Now, I need to explain more what I mean about that term. What, is, what does continuously differentiable mean? Um, let me just use a different letter, G from, say, R2 to R is continuously differentiable uh, on, let's say, U, a subset of R2, if um, GX, GY, well, if GX, if GX and GY, ah, sorry, if GX and GY um, are continuous, on you. Now, some there's a, there's a tendency students have to conflate this criteria with the thing we proved in the last class, which was that complex differentiable implies continuous. All right, I'm not talking about continuity of G. I'm talking about the continuity of the partial derivatives of G, which is a separate kind of continuity. There are examples, in fact, of functions which are continuous and have partial derivatives which exist and yet are not continuously differentiable. Those are bad examples. We want to avoid those. The, yes? I mean, I can give you an example, but. So, um, I mean, the thing about partial derivatives is they're just defined along coordinate lines, right? Like partial g, partial x, and partial g, partial y, which is g sub x and g sub y. Those really just involve data about the function along the coordinate axis, right? So if the function's doing all kinds of weird stuff off the coordinate axis, it could be that the function's not really differentiable in the sense of having a well-defined tangent plane um, at the point in question. But anyway, I mean, I, I will talk more about that next class. So, <clears throat> so that, that's what we mean by continuously differentiable. But you see, once we get through that little um, you know, technical nuance here, the continuously differentiable bit, then you have this really nice way of proving something is complex differentiable, just in terms of taking real partial derivatives. Let me show you, an, let me show you a, uh, a simple example, and then we'll do a more difficult one. Suppose we have f of z is equal to z squared. So in order to use the Cauchy-Riemann equations, we have to first identify what is the real and the imaginary component functions of the, of the given function, right? So how do you do that? You ha I mean, usually for a given, given problem, you have to do some algebra or something. So for this one, it suffices to just multiply. What do you get? So we get x squared minus y. The minus y squared comes because i squared is equal to minus 1, right? And you get 2xy. So can you identify what the u and the v are here? So here you have it. That's my u. And not including the i, the coefficient is v. So u is equal to x squared minus y squared, and v is equal to 2xy. Good news, these are continuously differentiable. But in order to really answer that question specifically, we have to calculate the partial derivatives. Now, I said, I said u and v are continuously differentiable, right? So that's actually four derivatives you've got to think about. 
ux, uy, vx, vy, right? All four of those must separately be continuous. But we can calculate those without too much trouble here, right? ux equals 2. 2x uy is equal to minus 2y. vx is equal to 2y. And vy is equal to 2x. Where again, I'm saying v is equal to 2xy. And I'm saying u is equal to x squared minus y squared. So there's your. There's your four derivatives, right? And observe, ux is indeed equal to vy, and uy is equal to minus vx. Hence, the Cauchy-Riemann equations hold. And what do we find? f prime of z is equal to ux plus ivx, which in this case is what? 2x plus i times what? 2y, which by the way, we could write as 2z, of course. Yes, shockingly, the derivative of z squared is 2z. No surprise there, right? But this method is radically different than what we've been doing up till now, right? Do you see a limit? No limits, right? So in order to apply the theorem of Cauchy-Riemann here, we need to do what? We need to be able to identify the, yes, sir? So we're talking about complex differentiability. And it, for z squared, the derivative f prime of z was still just um, 2z, like it would be for um, if f of x or mm -hmm. f of y. Right. Is that something that we're going to see as consistent, or is it going to have just a couple of... So your, your question is basically, can we es exploit analogies to real analysis? And if so, when? Yeah. Yeah. The answer is yes, all the time, everywhere. It's conceivably possible. Okay. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> it's actually really hard to find um, places <laughs> Examples in real analysis where we can't do something. I mean, the major thing is ordering. The fact that we have x less than y for any two real numbers. The best thing we have of analogy to that is the modulus of z is less than the modulus of w as a means of comparison. Um, so we lose some things, like you don't have a first derivative test. Okay. You know, I mean, it's not, not we get everything. I mean, there's, there's limits to this, but um, many things transfer over, yes. Let me show you another example. This one's a little more fun. Suppose you have f of z is equal to e to the z. What, what would we like to happen? What do you think f prime of z should be, Michael? E to the z. Very good. Let's derive that. So we have f of x plus i y is what? e to the x plus i y, right? But what's that? That's e to the x e to the i y, right? Now it's still not in our u plus v format, right? One more step, we got e to the x cosine y plus i e to the x sine y. Aha, now we've got it in its Cartesian form. In other words, this is my u, and e to the x times sine x is my v. Oh, by the way, this I mean, this is fun, but this is just a start of things, by the way. There, there's much, much more to say about the connection of the u and the v and the, and the f of z. But uh, one, one lecture at a time, I just tell you, the connection between these functions is very interesting. OK, so 
What's ux? <laughs> Zero. Yeah, e to the x uh, cosine y. I guess you could have told me it's u. That would I couldn't have argued with that. Um, Uy is what? Right, minus e to the x sine y. The x is v again, right? Oh, you guys, don't let me get away with that. This should be what? Is this an x? No. This is not an x. This is a y. <laughs> sine of y. I've written sine of x for some odd reason. Um, OK, e to the x sine y is vx. And then vy is e to the x cosine y. Clearly, ux, uy, vx, vy are continuous on the whole complex plane, right? Which we can identify as R2. <coughs> Hence, and the CR equations hold, right? It's clearly true that ux is equal to vx, uh, vy rather, and uy is equal to minus vx, right? at all points. Hence, f prime of z is equal to ux plus ivx. In other words, it's what? ex is e to the x cosine y plus i e to the x sine y, which to Michael's delight, becomes ddz of e to the z is equal to e to the z. So, yay. <laughs> and again, as I was telling you guys last time, this is a, a monstrous beast to, to try to think about in terms of the difference quotient. And I don't think Car Theodori helps you much either. <laughs> but with Koshi Riemann, we dispatch it with ease. Can that you do factor it. Factor out the power series. Power series? Uh, we have yet to develop the theory of complex power series, though, so that's outside our grasp at the moment. But, but yes. Um, in fact, if I was to define the exponential in an arbitrary and an arbitrary, uh, over an arbitrary associative algebra, that would be my approach. I would, I would define it in terms of its power series and study the properties that are given to it from that. Yeah. But, OK, that's <laughs> another day. Um, <laughs> so again, I'm going to talk about the theory that justifies this theorem next class. Let me just do a little bit more with this. What other functions would we like to differentiate? 2x. <laughs> or 2b. Oh, how about a non-example? How about a non-example? f of z is equal to z bar. So here we have x minus i y, right? So u. Uh, is equal to x, and v is equal to minus y. So you can see that ux is equal to 1, and you can see that vy is equal to minus 1, which is, of course, not equal to 1. So hence, f is not um, complex differentiable. Well, anywhere. Because this, <laughs> this contradiction to the Cauchy Riemann equations. The Cauchy Riemann equations are a necessary consequence of complex differentiability. Okay. They are not sufficient because you need that continuous differentiability in order to piece the partial derivatives together like you like. I'll explain the details of that next time again. Okay.
another example. How about f of z equals to Okay. Sorry. I have to watch out. Uh, f of z equals to cosine of z. So what's that? That's uh, cosine of x plus i y, right? Which is what? OK, and now you guys remind me, how do we convert cosine and sine of i y to koshes and cinches? This is just kosh, right? Cosine of x, kosh of y, I believe. But how's the sine and the cinch relate? Fine. I will go back to basic sine of i y, since no one's volunteering the answer. e to the i times i y minus e to the minus i times i y, which is what? e to the minus y minus e to the y. So this is what? This is also equal to minus i, or just i times 1 half e to the y minus e to the minus y, where I, I, I got a minus from flipping the i upstairs, and then that multiplied the minus through to put the y first and the minus y second. And of course, then we've got what? i cinch y. So this is just a reminder. I do expect you know how to do this. I mean, and fast. It takes you 10 minutes to figure this out. You're going to have a hard time on my test. Just warning you. Bad things have happened in previous years on this issue. <laughs> so, but not you guys. All right, so you, and this is v, right? So v is equal to minus sine x cinch y, right? u is equal to cosine of x cosh of y. Now clearly, these are continuously differentiable functions because you can differentiate. And when you differentiate with respect to x or y, you just get coshes and cinches and sines and cosines, all of which are continuous everywhere. So continuous differentiability, not an issue. So we, it suffices to check. So continuous, well, let's say continuity of ux, uy, vx, vy is clear. Need to check the CR equations, right? So what do we got? We got minus sine x. cosh y, right? Uy is cosine x, cinch y. Um, Vx is minus cosine x, cinch y. Vy is uh, minus sine x, cosh y. Remember, derivative of cosh and cinch is just cinch and cosh, respective, no signs, whereas sine and cosine have that one sign. Differentiating cosine gives you minus sign. And do we have what we need? Yep. ux is equal to vy, and vx is equal to minus uy, as we want. So what's the derivative? So the derivative with respect to z of cosine z. Ah! 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 Get it out! Cease and desist! U ux plus i vx. So we got minus sine x cosh y minus i cosine x 
inch y, which you can check is equal to minus the sine of z. That this is, in fact, the real and imaginary expansions of sine and, and, and in, in, the, in the x. If you put sine of x plus i y and, 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 and work it out. In fact, the derivative of co complex cosine is just minus complex sine. All right, can any of you think of a more efficient? Now, if I, if I ask you to show the derivative of cosine is minus sine z using the cauchy riemann equations, this is what I'm looking for, right? And wh what I'm really looking for there is not logical efficiency. I'm just looking for me to sh see that you actually know the relation between hyperbolic cosine, sine, and all, and all the rest. That's really what the question's about besides just cauchy riemann equations. In terms of laziness, if I want a logically minimal argument here, this is by far a poor choice. What's the easier way to do this example? Right, cosine of complex exponentials. Right, and complex yeah, we, exactly. So we write cosine of z is 1 half, ah, e to the i z ah, ah, plus e to the minus i z. I will finish this example. <laughs> DZ. Yes, we proved the chain rule earlier today. We ought to be able to use it. So the chain rule gives us i over 2 e to the iz minus i over 2 e to the minus iz. And so if you factor out um, you know, minus 1 over 2i, you've got e to the iz minus e to the minus iz, which is minus sine z. Of course, that's faster, yes. And the thing is, I know it's complex differentiable because it's the, co it's the, it's the composite of, of, of cosine, uh, excuse me, of the exponent. It's a sum of exponentials composed with i times z. Uh, everything there is complex differentiable, so the composite is complex differentiable. So I'm not, it's not, you know. But yeah, that's a faster way, obviously. <coughs> but anyway. So in other words, you should follow instructions. I have the instructions there to try to instruct you in the different arguments. There's three main arguments we have, right? Limit, definition, Carthiodori, and now Cauchy-Riemann. So with that, I will be quiet. Thanks, Malia. Yep, hit it.